Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, webinar that we're bringing in conjunction with our partners, Amberjack. Um, really important session that we're covering today, social mobility. The idea of this is a social mobility workshop. We've got plenty of speakers um, to explore this topic. Um, as usual, with all the IC webinars, we will also have time at the end, 10 to 15 minutes, um, just to go through any questions that you might have. So please do use um, the, the, the chat function and use the, the Q&A function. My name's Steve Isherwood. Um, I'm Chief Exec of the IC, and I'll be acting as, as MC see for them for this for this for this webinar today and just to say up front a big thank you to, to Emily and the team at Amberjack you know a lot of the content that we bring to yourselves we couldn't do without the support of people like like Amberjack supporting um, and working with us so a big thank you there to, to, to kick us off um, a reminder that we will record the webinar so all the IC webinars do go online after the event. So if there's anything that you want to recap, you'll be able to um, um, you'll be able to look at that at the recording. Or please do share the recordings as well. Obviously, we're very keen for um, all our knowledge sessions to be shared as far and wide as possible. So we share the learning. So please feel free to do that when you get the link sent through um, a bit later today. Um, so let's crack on. We've got plenty of speakers, which always puts a bit of pressure on time. So Emily, I'll hand over to you, first of all, um, Emily from Amberjack, and take it away from here. Perfect. Thank you, Stephen. A uh, warm welcome from us all today. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for joining the session. Um, so um, just wanted to um, introduce myself. My name is Emily Bryant. I'm head of marketing at Amberjack. And just before we go into the session today, wanted to just let you know that we will be obviously recording the session but we will be setting up a, a social mobility um, uh, a hub for you to access at the beginning of next week. So there's lots of speakers today, lots of insight, lots of research, but that will all be in one place for you at the beginning of next week to, to access. So we'll, we'll make sure that you get, uh, get the link to that. Um, for those of you who've joined our sessions recently, you'll probably be familiar with the, uh, with the format. So um, we, we tend to um, keep our, our events relatively informal and invite a range of different industry experts, employers and where relevant students and graduates to come and talk about certain challenges and topics uh, within the sector. So we're not here today to provide you with all the answers, but we do hope that you will at least take away a couple of things, uh, whether that be some insights some research or some initiatives that you haven't heard about back to your organisations to discuss and, uh, and maybe implement. So just to give a little bit of context around uh, the session today, um, each year at Amberjack we host and, and deliver our insight research and that's uh, comprised of two main parts. So an employer survey and also we analyse um, candidate data from over 300,000 applications. And from the employer survey this year, uh, diversity and inclusion um, was by far um, the most, um, the, the biggest challenge for, for employers in, in, in our sector. Um, and probably no surprise, but it was a big change from, from the previous year. And when we delved into that in a little bit more detail, social mobility was absolutely at the forefront um, in terms of focus for the new recruitment season. So what we wanted to do today is just, um, as I say, bring together a group of people who can start sort of sharing their experiences, their insight, and hopefully allow you to, um, to take something back to, back to your, your, your teams and organizations. Perfect, so without further ado, I am going to um, introduce our, uh, our panel um, and really excited to have such a range of um, expertise and, uh, and people with lots of different experiences today to, to, to contribute. So um, I'm going to ask them all just to do a very quick introduction and, uh, and we'll start with Jasmine. Oh, Jasmine. Yes, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Jasmine. I work with Amberjack as a marketer. Oh, you're a little bit glitched, Jasmine. Carry on though. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah, maybe turn your camera off for a bit, see how you get on. Okie dokie. Right, well, I'm Jasmine. Uh, I graduated in 2020. I currently work with Amberjack and work on some of the content and things. And um, I'm gonna to talk today a bit about uh, the experience that me and my brothers and sisters have had uh, from a low socioeconomic background perspective uh, with my own experiences, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Tonya, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Tonya. I am Director at TG Consulting. Um, we're a very new, um, 
startup. We started two weeks before COVID hit us, so it's been quite an interesting journey. Uh, the focus of the consultancy is employability, student engagement, social mobility and racial equity. Um, we work with education and employers and the beneficiaries of all the work that we do are students. So we're very much focused on um, collaborations and partnerships. Um, and we also have students within the business who work with us as co-creators of the solutions that we then take out to market. Um, my background is higher education. I've also worked in professional bodies. Um, so, yeah, it's great to be with you today. Thanks, Tonya. Ben, over to you. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Triggs. I'm a director at Bright Network, the careers network connecting um, students from all backgrounds to uh, to different career paths. Um, today, um, based on the work that we did uh, when we put together a uh, report uh, earlier this year around social mobility and taking 10 tangible steps from expert advice across the sector and also 100 employers um, supporting it. Um, hopefully I'll be able to give some insights based on what we found there through that research report across the, across the year. I'm sure you absolutely will. Looking, looking forward to hearing more. And um, Jamie, um, would you like to, uh, to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi there, my name is Jamie Wolf. Um, I work for Enterprise Holdings and represent Enterprise Rent-A-Car brand. Um, I've worked for Enterprise for 20 years. Um, 11 of those years has been in a, in a talent acquisition function. Um, we're a, a, a volume recruitment um, uh, company. We hire around two to two and a half, sometimes 3,000 graduates a year. Um, and we've been through lots of changes. The, the pandemic's really opened our eyes to new ways of doing things. And we've learned a lot. And there's some great stuff that we've found value in, um, especially around that sort of... Um, um, sort of uh, diversity in terms of social mobility and giving people um, equity in the, in the in the application and interview process. Yeah, looking forward to sharing some of our our sort of recent findings and, and recent experiences. Brilliant, thanks, Jamie and Sarah. Hi, thank you. So I'm Sarah Cleveley. I'm the National Engagement Director at Speakers for Schools. Um, and we provide uh, virtual and face-to-face -face work placements for um, any young person in the UK at state schools and also inspirational talks. I joined Speakers for Schools two years ago, um, just as COVID hit. So we have had to adapt and change. Last academic year, we delivered 154,000 virtual work experiences and about 140,000. We reached 140,000 young people for our inspirational talk. So I'm really keen to share, you know, that change and how COVID it's affected the young people in schools and how we've managed to navigate that and hopefully um, move forward and give as many young people at state school the opportunities. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and just before we, we get stuck into asking some questions, the, the main themes for discussion today, we're going to look at candidate engagement. So hear from, from Jasmine about her experiences and some more from, from Tonya looking at those university and schools initiatives through um, you know, some of the work that um, Jamie's done and also Sarah and those employer challenges and solutions. So hopefully um, across those themes, there'll be um, some, some definite insight and, and new things for you to, to think about. So I'm gonna stop sharing now so you can see all of our, uh, all of our panel. Um, and I'm going to start with the candidate engagement piece. So um, back in October last year, um, I was lucky enough to um, to meet to meet Jasmine, and she went through a recruitment process with Amber Jack, and we um, we invited her to join us. And she's had an absolutely cracking first year with us. Um, but I think from from my perspective, has has certainly educated me about some of those hidden barriers um, that that students from lower socioeconomic groups face. And so I thought it'd be great for her to to come and just talk about her experiences because you don't know what you don't know. And I think that um, hearing from those who've been through um, a process re relatively recently, and she graduated at the peak of the pandemic, um, will hopefully have some some great um, great insight to share. So. Jasmine, do you want to just talk to us, um, sort of, first of all, about some of the barriers that you faced, sort of, throughout education, both at school and university? And I know you've talked to your brothers and sisters as well, so it'd be interesting yeah. to hear their perspectives. Uh, yeah, I think first off, can you can you hear me all right now? You can, you can, <laughs> perfect, perfect, okay. and see you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I thought that I'd kind of start with the fact that there are many different barriers that people from low socioeconomic backgrounds can face and they do 
impact people in many a different ways. So it's important to note that my experience is only my experience, but the first and I would say most poignant thing that comes to mind when I think of the barriers that I faced is definitely the lack of opportunity to attend things like clubs and school trips and other experiences where you can learn and grow within school. If it costs money, you can't always do that. Um, when I was at school, I wanted to go to Paris and my class also had a- oh, Jasmine, you're breaking up a bit again. Botswana and Zambia. And I would have so loved to go and do those things. And uh, oh, Jazz, you might want to just put your video off again. You're breaking up a little bit. Turn my camera off now. How's that? Yeah, that's better. Can hear you. Yeah. You got to uh, the trips, the school trips, if you want to pick up from there. Yeah, I've done that now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Okay, cool. Uh, yes, so we did, a, and I wasn't able to attend those, but then there was also a trip where you had to kind of help fundraise and put a deposit down for Botswana and Zambia. And that is a trip that I would have loved to attend with my school friends, um, but I couldn't. I couldn't afford the deposit for any of those trips. Um, and they would have been great experiences, I am sure, for, you know, developing myself and experiencing teamwork and, and getting to see the world while I was at school. Um, so clubs and trips is definitely one of the first things that comes to mind. Um, but then when you think about free clubs and free opportunities, I was also on free school meals. And so things that weren't uh, run at lunchtime, such as lunchtime clubs, I wouldn't have been able necessarily to attend the whole club because I would have had to go and get my food from the canteen. I wouldn't have been able to just take my food and, and go straight to the club with my lunchbox. So there are many different ways in which the smaller things and the nuances of having a low socioeconomic background can affect the things that you can do. Um, at home, for example, uh, we, my brothers and sisters and I had one laptop between us. So that would mean that things such as research, homeworking, um, would all have to be done by taking turns. Um, now, I'm also lucky that I didn't struggle too much academically, but my brothers and sisters did have more of an issue with that. And things such as tutoring cost money. Um, so there are so many different ways in which the restrictions that you have from being a low socioeconomic individual can really impact uh, your ability to grow and experience the world. Um, and when it comes to things like transport and getting home from school, I was lucky enough that I lived really close to school, but if you are a family who lives slightly further away, you can't then attend things like after school clubs for free because you have to get home before a certain time. So there are just loads of different things to consider. Yeah. Thanks, Jasmine. And I think it's 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 um, really insightful to hear just some of the, the hidden things that, you know, we, we wouldn't necessarily or employers wouldn't necessarily think about when, you know, when considering students for, for employment opportunities. And from your experiences, do you feel that it's it's impacted your career choice at all in terms of, what you do or location. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so there are a few different ways in which this definitely impacted my career choices. Um, one of the number one ways is that I didn't really have any pre-existing networks to utilize. When you have adults in your life that are part of professional organizations or have a job that you can kind of look up to, um, you can utilize that knowledge, you can ask them questions and they can ask other questions to their colleagues. And there's that lack of access to knowledge that you have when you don't have that in your life. Um, and this meant that um, after COVID, when I graduated in 2020 um, and I was on universal credit, kind of looking for my jobs, 
um, I applied for around 100. Um, and that was obviously quite difficult. I couldn't just go and talk to somebody in my life who could you know, guide me on where to look for jobs or where to you know, utilize a network. So things like that really did have an impact, but it also impacted the jobs that I did put myself forward for because I, in, uh, you kind of have to say it, I needed a certain amount of money. Um, I needed a certain amount of hours to be able to afford the things that I wanted to do and my flat. Um, so I did get a job with, um, and I was very lucky that it was in an industry that I really enjoyed in digital marketing um, on a Kickstart placement. But when I wanted to continue that with that organization at that time, they couldn't give me any more than 25 hours and couldn't upgrade my wage, which meant I had to then go and look for another job. So there are many different things that you can't apply for because if you, want to apply for a job you're passionate about, but they don't pay enough, you can't. So um, it definitely impacted in that regard. Um, the, another, uh, sorry, <laughs> another area where things were quite difficult is, yeah, the, the lack of knowledge and opportunities available. So, in many ways, you don't know things like what an internship is or what a placement is. You haven't necessarily come across those before. So where social media is going to be your ally here, because all of those students who don't necessarily know that are going to have access to that. But if the brand that you're looking at is talking about internships and placements and lots of different jargon when it comes to the working world, we're not going to necessarily know what you mean and we think that maybe that's not for us because we're not professional we haven't had that background and we think that those things are for people who are professional um so i think we look at those things and decide that the value of it isn't for us and we would consider it passing it off because it isn't for us um so i think that those are the main kind of barriers, especially that I faced, not being able to utilize pre-existing pre networks, um, a lack of professional role models and uh, a lack of knowledge about, yeah, the jargon and the things that employers put out. Thanks, Jasmine. And, and thanks for being so, so frank and honest about your experiences as well, because um, I know from talking to you just how hard you had to work to, to, to find a role. And, you know that resilience and, and grit that you've got to to do that is um is 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 pretty impressive so um Tonya I'm going to come on to you now um because I know that you have recruited a number of 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 interns um to help develop your your program and and the majority of them were from lower socioeconomic backgrounds I'd be interested to hear how you went about doing that what your engagement looked like and if you could share some some insight mm -hmm. on that yeah, so um, in the first two years of operating, we recruited 84 interns into the business. All of them were paid um, and 15 of them were Kickstarters. Um, the way that we recruited the university students was via the university programs that run where they ask for projects or internship opportunities. So a lot of that recruitment side was led by the universities and then they recommended students to us. But most of the students, I'd say 90% of the students we've taken on were from low socioeconomic groups. Um, what we have basically, it's not been at all easy and I'd be lying if I say it was, but the value that that has brought us has been second to none. So to start with, obviously, you know, it's required a lot of patience because the students haven't really had any experience that they've brought. Um, they've brought enthusiasm, which you can do so much with. Um, but we've really had to look after them. So, you know, as part of their induction process, for example, we explain the employment contract, we explain how to resign and let them know that it's OK to leave an organisation. Um, you know, the explanation of the fact that it's a bank holiday, you don't have to work, what that means. 
um, we've had a lot of emotion. So when we've provided positive feedback to a lot of our interns, there's been tears because they felt so overwhelmed that, oh my God, I'm number one, doing something really well, but also they've had limited networks and limited individuals to celebrate them. So we do a lot of that celebration more than I would probably have done in a previous role, but we kind of have to really build that confidence and kind of encourage them. You know, we're very much of the line of, you know, it doesn't matter if you make a mistake, none of you are winning the finances or whatever, so it's fine to make mistakes. And we've got a very open kind of culture where it's okay to ask for help, it's okay to ask for questions, it's understanding that actually sometimes people do have a bad day, but that's okay. So we've got a very open culture and we've built a lot of trust actually um, within the team. So they've been instrumental in working you know I can honestly say that without the interns we've had I don't think I would have done half of what we've been able to do as a business and grow how we've grown so you know I think one of the best things that I've done over the last couple of years is bring the students in yeah yeah and I guess in terms of how that's then helped you develop the program which we can come on to a bit in in a moment um from your perspective, I know you've got such a, a broad range of experience, but from, you know, working with these universities um, really closely from, from your perspective, what, um, what, what are they doing? So what initiatives have you seen that employers can sort of get involved in and, um, and be part of to, to help access these, these students? So, so many of them don't even know about the opportunities or don't have the confidence. So mm. how, how is, what have you seen from a sort of a university employer perspective that, that seems to have worked well? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's a lot of universities that are still doing some of the traditional milk round activity. And I think there is a place for that. But I think universities now, now, their budgets have reduced even further, but they've still got to benefit the masses rather than the few. There's things like the access and participation plan where universities have got to show the value, the impact on individuals distance travelled. So I think in the main, what we've noticed, actually, a lot of these universities, they are still running bespoke programmes. So looking at specific stuff for care leavers and estranged students, for example, identifying actually, you know, a, a group of students that are um, first generation and kind of what does something bespoke look like to them? Because actually the needs that a first generation student has is very different to the needs that somebody who's been in care has. So there's a lot of understanding and actually universities are gold mines for employers. So the approach that I would would advise which we talk about with our employer clients is actually it's not a we're going to launch this program and run it for everybody because it's not going to work at each university how they work how they operate their student demographic is very different so I would advise you know that employers trust the universities to kind of guide them in terms of what's going to work what isn't and some of it may be kind of stuff completely off the radar but that's often the stuff that works um, so some of the things that we're working with some of our clients is um, upscaling, obviously, work experience programs, looking at putting some of that in the curriculum so that doing a placement isn't a barrier to students if it's part of the curriculum. Uh, we're looking at specific development programs for groups of students, but working with the students to co-create the program so that it meets what they need. Um, so yeah, it's, there's, there's some really exciting things that are coming out um, and I think it's a really good opportunity to innovate. So if there's any employers out there that want to do something a bit different um, and something exciting, there are universities out there that actually really want to push the boundaries and do something different, which is what we've been lucky enough to find with the work that we've done. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Tonya. And, and Sarah, I wonder if you could, could, could sort of perhaps jump in now around the, the, the schools piece, because I know obviously Tonya is talking about student engagement at a, a university and um, at level, but all of the work that, you know, speakers for schools do um within you know within state funded schools i wonder you know from, from a from a challenges perspective jasmine's talked about some of her experiences are, are, i'm i'm sure you are still seeing some of those play out every, every day and and what are you doing as an organization that you know the employers watching today could potentially um you know get involved in sure um yeah um thank you jasmine for being so honest i think um my list and I listed it through all the feedback we've had and we're really seeing uh, exactly what Jasmine shared so lack of understanding of what's on offer no networks personally no networks via the school um, general disengagement in terms of since Covid it's been really difficult for people to go back to school and be motivated um, too many choices 
lack of understanding of all the different industries. Um, I think somebody mentioned no support, so they haven't got the support or knowledge outside of school of those industries. Um, access, so the money to get to places, location, geography, yeah. um, and no opportunities in what they're interested in as well. So, you know, um, there are opportunities out there, but not in every industry. So um, speakers for schools, um, particularly with the virtual offer, um, what we've tried to do to address it is first thing is, is it's free. It's free for state schools and it's free for young people. And we make that really clear because often people just assume there's a cost. So um, there, there isn't and there never will be at Speakers for School. So any young person at a state school can access it for free. I think that's trying to break down some of those barriers. We make it really easy to apply. So again, people don't understand that application process and haven't got the support. So we've been trying to make sure that there's only one or two questions on that application. They're very general. You don't need the knowledge of the industry to apply. Um, the opportunities are there because it's virtual for us. So ir irrespective of where someone lives, which has been a, a great removal of some of those barriers. Um, linking opportunities to subjects at schools. So that's one thing we've moved to try and do. So if you're great at a subject at school, we're trying to link the opportunity. This may be something that you're interested in. Um, we're also not limiting um, the length. So we've got very short opportunities or longer. Again, that's because people can't always commit to kind of a week or a full day. So we're really trying to give a range of timings. Um, we're working with over 900 employers, so we are diversifying our industries to attract more young people who have got their own ideas about what they want to do. Um, all of our placements are live and interactive, and we're really keen that all employers give feedback. So just, just feeding back on what we've just heard, feedback seems to be really positive because people often haven't had any feedback. And th that feedback needs to be positive and constructive. Um, and also we're working very closely with teachers to help identify those young people who might need that extra help to come and apply and that extra confidence. So I think that kind of summarises what we're doing in terms of our virtual offer. Um, yeah. So I was really interested to hear Jasmine because, you know, it fed into a lot of the things we're trying to do to break down some of those barriers. Yeah. And what, is, what are some of the outcomes you've seen? From, from those programmes? Because obviously you're impacting a huge, a huge number. Um, what are you starting to see from, from those programmes in terms of, you know, how it's improving, you know, um, you know opportunity for, for those students? I, th I think um, one of the uh, one of the nicest stats we've got is over 90% of the students, we survey them all, say that their in, um, uh, uh, confidence has improved for their career, next career choice. So not just because they liked the placement, sometimes it actually gives them the information they need to know that that's not the career for them. And the nice thing is, is we have no limit to how many placements uh, someone goes on. So okay. um, a lot of the feedback is, is we've done nine now in a year because they haven't got to travel. And actually we've found something that's triggered that light. Um, I think the other important feedback that we've gained that might be really important for employers is, is that um, all placements always start or end in the journey. So how does that young person go on to further engage in that career? And that's something now we're trying to say to employers, this is essential. So the feedback we've had is, is as part of the um, experience, we need to be really clear for that young person on what journey they need to go on. And actually, there's usually five different journeys they could go on. And that is often catered to that individual's academic level or where they live. So um, I think one of the really exciting things is, is we're seeing young people go on multiple experiences to really try out and then feeding back that actually I now know what I've got to do to get there. And I think that is so important. So that's one of the biggest things I'd say to an employer is make sure you're clear on all the different ways that young person can come and, and work and join you as an employee. I, th I think that's really important. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think there's definitely the piece around that multiple experience. So you don't just come in and do one, but actually you can test out so many different options. Because again, that's one of the, the huge things, isn't it? I don't, you know, many of us didn't know what we wanted to do, but if you sort of push that back into school and then look at the different backgrounds, it, it, it becomes even, even harder. Yeah. Um, and one thing, I don't know if you just mentioned it then, but um, when we were talking previously, you said that the programs are even accessible on a phone so you don't even yeah. have to have a laptop to, to to be part of them which I think is which yes. is amazing again sort of removing one of those tech barriers as, as Jasmine was talking about um 
So, so Ben, we'll come to, to you now, if that's OK, because I think um, it would be great to hear about, um, you know, a bit more about the, the social mobility um, report that, that Bright Network uh, released a few months ago. And I know you were a critical part of that and, and, and drove that. So maybe you could just give a bit of background about that and maybe some of those sort of key challenges that employers were, were talking about within it. Yeah, absolutely. So very simply, we've got um, experts across the graduate career space, diversity space together, um, as well as leading HR professionals across a wide range of organisations. I'm sure some uh, might be on the on the call as, uh, as well. And the whole idea was less so bringing out all of the solutions, which actually, I, I don't think there are that many silver bullets in this. There's yeah. a lot of trial and error and a lot of testing that needs to be done to make sure we're progressing. Um, but bring out those challenges and really have kind of those open conversations and then it came to sort of 10 tangible starting points I guess for where organizations can um, can uh, can start improving um, their social mobility when it came to some of the sort of challenges that um, that we saw across the industry I think buy-in across the organization was um, more troublesome than maybe some other areas of uh, the DNI space I think there still is possibly amongst some senior stakeholders the want for you know Russell Group universities or or, or whatever it, it might be and I think there's always a data collection challenge as well and I think everyone on the call will um, understand that uh, that challenge what data do you actually collect to identify people that need the support either before the process through the process or when they're starting in in the working world and without the clarity around the data potentially um, that's where things can kind of slip through the cracks and people can't identify um, the problem quite as easily or it's difficult, more difficult to communicate to senior stakeholders the, uh, the challenges that do occur. And I think the final thing was um, actually where maybe university uh, life can sort of teach employers that there's a group called 93% uh, Club that's gone national over the last couple of years, an incredible organisation. And I think... Um, there is less so compared to maybe um, groups around sexuality or ethnicity or gender. Uh, they are uh, very strong often in organisations, but around social mobility, um, potentially um, less, less, less strong, possibly less, uh, less people being advocates for it um, and therefore maybe not driving quite as much change. So I think those were the range of uh, challenges amongst many others that we, we saw from the, from the conversations that we had. Yeah. And I think the data one is, is one that always comes back up in terms of, you know, especially once people have applied, how do you recognise, you know, who they are and how do you support them best through through the process? There's always quite a lot of uh, discussion, isn't there, around, you know, what you measure and, and, and those flags that you need to, to, to put in place. Um, and so I guess come, coming on to the, the, the sort of the, the 10 steps that, that you talked about. And again, this report will be available on our hub, but it would be great to hear as a you know, as an output from all of that research and you know it was in collaboration with a huge number of employers what those you know what those 10 steps or, or certainly the top the top steps that that came out of that in terms of practical practical solutions and and action yeah and i think probably tying into the challenges like working out what is going to be measured is the key thing and i think people hark back to the idea of a free school meal it's already been mentioned on the on the call parents went to university school type parental occupation they're all sort of things that people would consider um i recommend collecting more more than one which is which is definitely um definitely worthy but also making sure you're consistent with your measurements so you can compare um over time and also trying to go out to the business to see where you're up to at, uh, at this point. Um, but I, I understand the challenge with it. I was actually speaking at one of our events a couple of weeks ago with someone um, who said there was a group that got together, I think in the financial sector, and they worked out the question should be, um, do you consider yourself from a lower social economic background? So not a maybe defined me measure or metric, but actually how people feel within themselves, which I found yeah. really interesting, to be honest with you, more than, more than anything. Um, and then I think the application process process uh, is the key key place to to look at um, and that's where we focused a lot of our uh, top tips um, what you're actually looking for out of candidates and whether stuff like their grades or anything like that needs to be um, as important as it may be within the organization and also stuff like testing which people from uh, with backgrounds of means are, are more likely to perform better on purely because they might have had the support the coaching the uh, the, the tutoring that um, Jasmine talked about earlier as well um, 
And then the second part of it is whether there can be put stuff put in before the application process and during the applica uh, application process to um, not give everyone anyone an advantage, but make sure those that feel less confident um, within the process um, can give their best self during the, the interview. So what you can interject into your process around the interviews, the testing, to make sure everyone feels comfortable and confident. It doesn't feel alien to them. Um, my final point, which kind of backs up what's been said before, is that um, by the end of university, our data suggests that 23% from a non-selective state school would have done a formal internship. Um, if they've if they've gone to that non-select state school, whereas 35% um, would have done one from a from a private school. So if you're looking for some someone that's just kind of got the internship in the sector that you're you're working in, you're more likely to hire people from private schools because they're more likely to get the internships. Um, so definitely look at those and that wider range of experience, which I know has been talked about a lot on similar sort of calls, but uh, I definitely want to reiterate that message as well. Perfect. Thank you. And um and lots more in that report, I'm sure. But I think it leads really nicely into, into Jamie. He sat there very patiently listening to all of, all of this. But um, I think many of you will know, know Enterprise and their, um, their commitment to, to, um, to, to diversity and inclusion as a, as a whole. But I think Jamie's got some, um, some great insight and experiences to, to share. And Jamie, I think I thought it was really interesting when we were talking the other day about, you know, the pandemic and, and sort of how that changed the way in which, you know, enterprise recruit. Do you want, do you want to start there? And then we can go on to some of the other things that you've, um, that you've implemented. Yeah, I mean, I think we're all probably um, a little bit jaded in terms of hearing about the pandemic and, and, that, and that COVID word, but it, it really had a big impact on our journey as a, as a, sort of a large scale graduate recruiter. We've always been proud of our social mobility um, initiatives and activities. Um, out of the 203 um, companies that registered to be part of the social mobility index, um, again, we've, we've, we've ranked in the top 10. Now, this has always been something we've been proud of, but then we thought we were the experts, but then COVID helped us go again and learn um, again and really look at our social mobility um, objectives and ways of working. Now, we used to um, uh, invest a lot of time and energy into the physical face-to-face -face interview. So we used to um, have an 80% um, face-to-face recruitment process where people would go to travel to an office with a, a suit on and he or she would then be interviewed by a person in a room um, across a table like we all remember. Uh, then that person would then travel back home, at great expense, having to buy a suit, having to go on the train. Um, and they would then come back for an assessment centre, um, which probably would start at half past eight in the morning, go on till four o'clock, so they had to get a hotel, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a really um, people and I guess cost heavy process for candidates. Obviously COVID came, um, we were an essential provider. So we actually stayed open during the pandemic. So while we did downscale operations, we still needed to recruit. So we had to relook at our recruitment process. So we moved it virtual um, and for people like myself that have been interviewing face-to-face -face for decades, um, we can't possibly interview everybody um, by the medium of, of a video screen, he says on a video um, conference meeting. Um, and it was about educating and upskilling our recruitment team that actually you can find the same information out about somebody um, by the medium of a video screen. But then I'll take it a step, for, step forward. So we went 80% um, from 80% face-to-face to 80% -face to virtual. So there's only this one little process at the end, which was done locally to the candidate, um, which actually meant they had to travel and invest time and, and effort and energy into taking time of work or finding the funds to travel. So we, we sort of, we, re we recognised this was a better journey for the candidate, but was it a better journey for the company? Because we still wanted to recruit the best and brightest talent, the future leaders for our business. Um, so then we started looking at um, the sort of dropout rates and the self select type rates and rejection rates, the various stages of the process. And we kind of, we had to upskill the team because we talk a lot about equity, about giving our employees equity, giving our employees um, the opportunities they need to be their best self. And that might be different for me as it is for somebody else and vice versa. And we realized that to give some equity in the interview process meant we had to recognize that not everybody has the capacity to interview on a laptop. So if someone's using a mobile phone for an interview, well, that's okay. That's fine. It's no different to a laptop. You can still get your point across the same way. You can still be as amazing as you can be, vice versa. So it was just, again, it was just about 
taking a step back and looking at, um, okay, we're interviewing differently and, it, and different people will respond differently because they might not have that quiet space to go and do the interview. They might not have the best tech. They might not have had the best lighting because, they, because they've been sort of coached and trained on that. So it's looking for, past that and looking beyond that. Um, we then took it another step. So that was the, the change in the recruitment process. Then we also recognised that um, after the sort of year, so year two of the pandemic, the last the last of the twelve months, our business has um, increased uh, exponentially. We've opened back up all our operations that were mothballs have gone back into full throttle. So we've had to recruit a lot of people. We've, we've hit we've hit the, we've done record hiring numbers, and to do that, what our applications, um, as a lot of graduate recruiters' um, applications, are down. So we had to find new ways to find applications. So what we did was we worked with um, our partners, we worked with TG Consulting and, and Tonya and the team, um, and we, we did several initiatives which um, put a spotlight on the fact that we are open to um, um, recruiting people from um, that social mobility um, WP background. But then we also ran some amazing initiatives where we took away the application process. And again, our recruiters said, you can't do that. We need an application to assess a candidate. And so we, we took away the application process and we guaranteed candidates on a national campaign. We said, if you apply, for, if you click this link and leave your name, email address and contact details, we will give you an interview. And we did exactly that. And that really opened our eyes to the company to the fact that you can hire great talent by, and still change the way you work. You can look at nuanced ways of connecting with candidates. And some of the candidates we um, have hired through the new application methodology is they've been incredible they've been brilliant and when we've spoken to them and, and got their feedback a lot of them said i wouldn't have completed that three-phase application online because it was too daunting when i found that i could just get an interview with the person i jumped at the chance so we, we've just learned so much and i think we're a better business for it we're a better team of recruiters for it and it's and it's really really made us all feel good about what we do at work Brilliant. And I think that whole sort of reinventing and, and, and looking and challenging yourselves um, to, to change sort of practices that are really ingrained in an organisation is, is, is quite tough. Just before we go to questions, because I can see there's a lot, so I want to leave 15 minutes to, to, to cover those. You, you talked about there was a bit of pushback from stakeholders. How did you overcome the sort of, you know, the challenge of saying, well, there's no, you know, there's, there's no process here. Why are we spending our time with these candidates? What was the, what was the process you went through to to, to overcome that? I mean, at the risk of sounding like um, a, an ardent recruiter, it was, it, was about, it was about numbers and volume. We, we knew we could get the best talent through this method. So um, we had really big staffing targets to hit. And we sat down as a team to try and work out how we could get to those targets. And the biggest barrier was that application. So we knew as a team we would get more hires through the door. Of, a, of an equal, if not better quality by taking this, this bold step, which we did. And it, and it worked really well for us. Um, and we've, we've got some particularly um, large hiring needs at, in certain pockets of the country, and a lot of them are cold spot areas. And we're gonna be rolling out this same methodology through the, our university networks actually, where they help us. Um, I mean, BCU is a great example. I can't sing their, prize, their praises more highly. They very forward thinking, um, they, they, they rank very high on the, um, university um, social mobility list um, and they work very hard to give their students every opportunity to get that graduate job so it's just about reaching out to your local university partners working with external organizations that specialize in these kind of um, initiatives and just challenging your own thinking brilliant thank you and um, i was going to come back to all of you really quickly and do your top three um recommendations on the topics that you've spoken about but we will share those in our in our follow-up so Stephen, I, I see that there are a lot of questions that have come in. Shall we, shall we start with some of those? Because I'm just really keen that people get their, get their questions answered. Sure, that's great. Thank. Yes, we have got questions on there. So um, feel free to pop more, and we'll try to um, we'll try to get them through um, um, in the next quarter of an hour. So um, I've got some questions here. I've kind of earmarked who I think is probably best to answer them. But um, but if you've got something to add, just give me a wave or stick your hand up, and I'll um, and I'll put it to you as well. Um, Jasmine, so come to you first. So um, one of the questions, in it, sorry, it, it, um, it, it links to what you just said, Emily, about top three. So the question was actually, Jasmine, what's the one thing you think employers could do to help people from a lower social economic background? Yeah, so I think actually the biggest concern for me um, 
would be making it easy to find the information on ways that you can help students with their application if you offer flexible working for example shout about it in your comms if you can help the students and the individuals financially with travel and things shout about it in your comms put it in your adverts before people even apply because we've talked a lot about unselecting yourself if i saw a job for an office i knew i had to get to said office but it's slightly further away I might not have applied for that. I might not have even considered applying for that if I didn't know in advance that there were ways that I could get there and things that could help. So I would, I think if you can help your low socioeconomic individuals in any particular way, shout about it. Cool, thanks Jasmine. Um, and one other question actually for you as well, which is around actually the language of social mobility, low socioeconomic background, they're terms that we're all relatively familiar with now. But I guess the question is, do students understand it? So do students, the question was, do students sometimes unselect themselves from any sort of support or programmes that they're at? Because they just don't get the language. They don't think it, it, it applies to them. Do you think that language is a challenge? Um, yes, actually. I think that this is an important point because there are loads of different ways in which you can be a low socioeconomic or a person from that background. Um, it's not just about free school meals. It's not just about having parents who didn't go to university. So it is about labeling all the different ways that somebody might struggle rather than just saying low socioeconomic, low socioeconomic background or free school meals so that people know all of the different ways in which they might qualify. Yeah, breaking it down for sure. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, Tonya, a couple of questions I'm going to point in your direction. Um, one of the uh, first questions that came through was around um, universities actually selecting people when you're saying that you're going to universities to, to, to recommend people. And the question was saying, actually, does that potentially cause a problem with the university maybe not knowing some people who may, may get help? So I wondered if you want to elaborate yeah. on that on that a yeah. little bit. Um, I didn't explain that very well. Sorry. What I meant was the universities had undertaken the recruitment for us based on the job descriptions we provided. So they'd undertaken the interviews and then put forward a candidate. Uh, the other option was that we'd done the interviews ourselves. So the students had still had to go through a recruitment process, but the university has specifically targeted groups of students based on whatever scheme or programme the funding was part of. So it was a fair process. It wasn't a, just because you're known to your service, we'll put you forward, the individuals had to apply. And this is a more sort of general question from my own experience. And I'm going back quite a while now, but I remember previous role I was in and we had a program and we worked with a couple of institutions. Um, one was very proactive in terms of engaging with its students, um, targeting because it was a, a um, um, social mobility program um, and were able to, to in a sense, recommend some students for us. And we were able to work with those students and we were aware of the limitations, but resources are finite. Then mm -hmm. another institution actually um, I think slightly ideological reasons, maybe resource reasons, actually um, weren't able to do that kind of help with that, I guess, selection or rationalising. So it just became, it was too much spray and pray. So actually, we just couldn't really do very much for the students because it was almost um, too many to try and deal with. Do you kind of have a view on that, getting the balance right between actually universities having to just... Um, um, having to sort of distinguish between students who might be more appropriate for a particular programme than not, but also, of course, that duty of care to all students. Is it a challenge or...? Um, I don't... Well, I wouldn't say it's a challenge, but obviously the universities have set pots of funding that they want to use to support specific groups of students. So they will use their university data to send targeted comms. Um, we're obviously running... We're running our partnership programme with uh, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, which is all around social mobility, and the universities that are partnering with us are targeting students from low school backgrounds, but the programme is fully inclusive. So the messaging is aimed to attract applications and participation from those students that anybody can attend no one's turned away so anyone who attends will get something from it but the nature of the comms and that's how we also recruit the nature of the comms and the messaging we put in just naturally attracts those that we want to bring in um so it's it it's just a lot of focus on language i'd say right thanks um thanks tonya 
Um, Sarah, a question um, that I think I put in your direction, first of all, which is around technology, and it did come up in some of the conversations from yourself and, and others. But I guess the question is, how much does a lack of technology impact engagement? Or maybe it's not sort of hardware or software it's actually just availability to broadband to have sorry to have access to good broadband good wi-fi etc yeah um we we at speakers for schools were concerned about this because um we didn't want to put all of these virtual placements on and then obviously exclude a lot of young people who, who couldn't attend so one of the things is we've got a platform where you can use it from your phone the other thing is is we ask the a careers lead or teacher to highlight um, if that young person has any issues and often the schools will then allow them to get a quiet space and will access it from the school for the day or for the hour or even for three days so we work very closely with the school so we've really not had a big problem with that but in terms of being really open and deepening those relationships with schools to ensure that every young person can access it and often that is in school um, and for those who don't have any issues they access it our placements from home so so we try and work with the individuals. But um, as I say, for us, uh, uh, enabling those young people if they have to on the phone has been a, has been really a great success for us because um, we found that, you know, that means that, that the people who are sharing laptops at home, etc., particularly in the COVID time, weren't limited as much. But now that schools are open, um, schools are very keen on al uh, and allowing those young people to access it from a school computer or within a, a school with Wi-Fi. Fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. Um, ben, uh, a straight question for you, actually, um, but I was wondering also if you had a thought around it, because obviously you reached huge numbers of students. I wonder if you have to think about the technology side as well. But in answering that, um, the question was also actually, are you possible to share a link to the report that you that you mentioned? I wonder if you were able to put that in the chat or send it through after. Uh, yeah, one hundred percent on the on the uh, report. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat after I've uh, stopped speaking. Um, but on the on the technology side, yeah, I think um, through application, I think during the pandemic, Wi-Fi bandwidth, all of that sort of stuff has uh, became a problem, as uh, sort of Sarah um, suggested. Now people are back at universities and actually sort of full full time can book out rooms in libraries and stuff like that. I think it is uh, it's it's a lot better. Um, however, I think I still think, you know, especially if applications are during sort of uh, holidays and, and, and things like that, um, even online, um, just taking everything kind of with a pinch start and really understanding that people shouldn't be uh, sort of judged on uh, on where they're taking the interview and stuff like that. And I think, you know, a little bit like when you have a first impression of, of someone where you meet them and you're looking for handshake, eye contact and, and stuff like that. Like, you know, some people aren't taught that. And the same with the virtual environment. If you look at a background which uh, which doesn't, um, it isn't similar to someone that's worked for 15, 20 years and they understand everything about being that kind of professionalism online and stuff like that, it shouldn't be counted against them. I think that's the big thing for employers. Right. Um, and Ben, I wondered if you had a view on this question as well that came through around salaries. I know this is a conversation that um, that is coming through more frequently around and actually our industry has not always been great at advertising salaries. I wondered again if that's if you had any thoughts on either how many employers are starting to offer that salary information um, you know, through channels like yourselves or if, or if there or if there are if there are ways that you think that students can access that information. Um, yeah, I'm, I've always been a massive advocate. I've been in the industry for seven, eight years now. I've been a massive advocate for opening up um, salary information for graduates on sort of graduate schemes. I can understand very small businesses why they not, might not do that. But for set graduate schemes, I think it can work. Um, ultimately, you're more likely to get applications. Our research suggests that transparency around salary um, is will lead to more applications. They feel more comfortable applying and they're more likely to complete their application once they've once they've started it. So um, as I say, it's not just my uh, my own personal opinion. I think the data does play out that um, if it is possible to release it, and I can understand in some cases it isn't, um, I would do that. And I think um, it's an important step for employers. It shows that they are um, open communication. Ultimately, Gen Z have had open communication through Instagram, TikTok, the internet and their entire lives. Um, and um, they're expecting that kind of level of transparency in from their employers. It's interesting this year, actually, um, from an employer perspective, I have more questions than ever around salary. So it's obviously employers are asking us because it obviously is an impact in the market, all the stuff we read about cost of living. This is a this is a really visible way I think where it impacts our market because 
that means students are being asked more about salaries and employers are thinking more about are they are they competitive or not um, Jamie, I've got a couple of questions um, for yourself that, that came through. Um, one of the first ones is actually around just how many interviews you mentioned that the um, and I miss an extra recruiter. I think, God, an interview to everybody. How the hell do you staff that up? <laughs> um, was it a huge amount of numbers that came through? Did you have to do it first come, first served? Was one of the suggestions on, on, the, on the question that came through? Just how did it work? I think a bit more detail. Yeah, it was a massive undertaking, but we had we had massive numbers to fill. So we guaranteed everybody an interview. So um, everyone got an interview. We left it we left it open and live for three weeks. Um, we, the, there was about a fifty two percent increase um, in applications during that period for those particular um, pockets where we needed the staff, um, and, and we, we had to invest in our team. We had to upskill um, some people that had. Um, hiring manager recruitment experience that were in managerial positions, bring them back in, upskill them, and draw upon the resources that we had. And the beauty of doing that is you bring people in that haven't been recruiting all day long for forever, so they have different um, opinions and maybe uh, maybe let less of the, the biases because they haven't sort of become conditioned to all the issues they do uh, day to day back to back. So yeah, it was a real team effort. Um, a big undertaking, but it yielded some fantastic results. And some of the people we've got in our business today are, are just incredible off the back of it. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, and another question that came through for yourself was around indicators. What indicators do you use to, um, I guess, to, to to understand the background of people that apply to you? Because I know that this is um, it's more complex than other areas of diversity of the questions and the markers that people use. So any insight you want to want to share on that? Yeah, in terms of, um, I mean, our applications, um, we, we steer away from uh, asking uh, which universities people have been to. Um, those That kind of information we, we capture, we ask, do you have a degree? Yes, I know. Do you have, um, what disciplines are in? And we tend to look at more of those, um, those sort of demogra that demographic information after the job offer has been made, so later down the path. Um, but we were proud in, in, what, in the fact that we recruit from all degree disciplines, from all universities. We don't ask for particular grades. Um, the, the, the caveat is you, you need to have a, a degree of some description. Um, so it, it really helps us um, in terms of that, mobility, that social mobility provision in terms of, a, of, of a, an employer that's open to everybody because you're not looking straight away. You don't screen people out because they haven't been to X, Y, Z university or haven't achieved a certain grade. Um, and again, it's just about upskilling the team to recognise that um, at different stages in the process, one person might be a really confident um, a video person in terms of talking, another person might be better face to face. And it's just making sure we're really, 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 really clear on that and that we're not looking for a particular person. We're looking for um, people that, have, that fit into the competencies that we assess against. Right, thanks. And one quick final question that just, just popped in, I can see that in the corner of my eye. The um, kind of volumes, what sort of numbers are enterprise recruiting nowadays? Um, we've got our, our fiscal year ends this year um, in August. So we're partway through the year and we've still got about two and a half thousand people to recruit. Um, so it's in excess of two and a half thousand. Um, if you think we've already we've already partway through through our fiscal year. Wow. That must make you pretty much, I think, one of the biggest commercial, if not the biggest commercial um student recruiter in the in the uk huge numbers got eye-watering <laughs> the um um so we're, I'm conscious of time we're very nearly at the hour so emily i was just going to pop back to you for one last question and it was um around actually what tools work best for eliminating bias i know this is a lot of work that amber jack do so i wondered if either there was any insights you wanted to share or or, or anywhere you could you could point um the person who asked the question on this yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll keep it brief because I know people will need to shoot. But I think, um, you know, and certainly from listening to everything today, um, you know, around the, the communication piece and the attraction piece. So thinking really carefully about your comms and how you create them and what the messaging is with, within that and, and also where where and how you communicate as well. So I think it's, it's a challenging market within schools, especially to reach all of the schools that you want to. But, you know, working with partners, but also, you know, looking at um, 
the different ways and different platforms that students communicate on so it's not all about just going directly into schools but looking at that sort of that blend of of social channels that you can use as well and yes we support with that at Amberjack and support a number of clients with that but it's also the assessment piece and that's very technical and not my area of expertise but but certainly you know picking up um on on the um on the points that Ben made about you know looking at that that bias piece right at the beginning you know whether it means removing an application form to making sure that your you know that your assessment um is you know has has no adverse impact etc so i think it's it's not you know what one thing obviously that makes a difference is looking at it holistically but um we will we will certainly share all of the insight collectively that we have from this group onto our social um, mobility hub which we hope to have ready for next week and on that we can obviously put more information around you know the different areas that you know all of these people here today can can support with so Fantastic. Thanks, Emily. Look at that. We're one minute over. That's pretty good timing, I think. So amazing job, panellists. Thank you very much. You've covered a huge amount of ground in um, um, over, over the last hour. And thanks to those of you who put questions in the chat. I think we got through pretty much um, um, all of them in the in the time. Um, as I said at the start, um, this has been recorded. So if you want to recap um, anything that we covered, we'll be able to do that for you. Um, you'll be able to get that when, do that when you get the link through. Also, as I said, um, we love to share the knowledge, etc. Um, if you want any more information, please get in touch with us here at the ISE or Emily at, at Amberjack. Um, really appreciate, um, as I said at the start, um, Emily, your, your support and the partnership we have in terms of um, building sessions like this, really great insights, insights that we provide to our members. Um, a quick reminder that um, data in your diary is October the 19th. Um, Nicola and the team is busy planning away, going through all the survey re results. So we'll have our main annual survey re launch on October the 19th, where of course we'll have all our, our market update data, but also updates around actually the whole EDI agenda and exactly what employers are, are working on and thinking at the moment and an update on that. So, 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 um, so um, just keep an eye on that as the comms come through from the IC over the next couple of weeks or so. So final thank you to the panellists. Big round of applause from me and a virtual round of applause from the audience. Thank you very much for your time. Um, everybody enjoy the rest of the day. Um, hopefully see you all in person or talk to you all soon online. Take care all. Thanks everyone.